And um, sorry, but the um, we will not record a meeting right now. So, can we um stop the recording for this part? Please. Yeah. Um. All right. Let me go ahead and start. Thanks, Marvin. So yeah, yeah. real, so real quick. I just want to thank everybody for the uh, attending the last. Sorry, that's my son screaming in the background. <laughs> for attending the last IEW presentation brought to you by our Global Titan Ambassadors. So they worked really hard on this and I just wanna let everybody know, I just I started the recording um, and so it is being recorded so we can post it on our website later. Um, and so let's um, try to keep um, the, mute, the mics muted for now so that there's no background noise or any mic feedback. You can use the chats to engage with each other and this is supposed to be a welcoming and a global community. So let's be uh, respectful of our present uh, presenters. They worked really hard on this presentation and of each other and let's talk soup. So I'm gonna give it back to Marvin. Thanks. Thanks, Eileen. Thanks, Eileen. And uh, how about the working right now? Is the link working? Yes. Okay, looking good, looking good. So uh, for us breaker, um, it's like, uh, we want to hear some words or like we want to gather some information quick information and then show it to everybody. Like what's the word when you hear about this, the word soup, what like comes up, what words came up in your mind? You might type three word uh, into this link and then we'll see a quick result in a bit. Okay, hello Vanessa. Okay, yeah. Um, let me know when you guys uh, did, and then we're probably going to wait for like uh, one, one minute or something to wait for the results. And meanwhile, actually, um, let me turn off the music. Okay, cool. So we have more clear voice. Let's see if anything came up in our site. Oh, okay. Wow. You guys are quick. Okay, let's see um, what words came up. Wholesome and uh, comfortable, tasty, happy, delicious, warm, yummy, hot. Like, what do you mean? What do you guys mean? Like, who typed the cozy? Oh, sorry, interesting. Like a cozy feeling. Yeah, yeah. I typed cozy too. Love that. And uh, hard to hard to cook. Yes, it's very hard. But I mean, depends. Uh, in my opinion, like cup noodle is quite easy. But like, uh, like for good soups, that does require many time to bring up the taste, for sure. And um, I also have creamy. And broth, healthy. Wow, nice. Hi. Uh, so for. Uh, you guys just joined, um, please click in the link in the comment box and then uh, type in three words you had in mind when you hear about the soup. Okay, and then we're going to see a quick result. Cool. All right. Oh, we got more. Okay, let's see. Um, mm, chicken. And winter, yes. Soup does bring me or like reminds me of, about winter almost all the time. Let's see. Oh, uh, yeah. And um, again, for anyone who might join late, please check, check out the links and then uh, join our icebreaker, please. Here, uh, you'll be able to enter this link in the site and then uh, create, put in three words. And um, right, just some quick question, like um, if you guys can talk or like you guys can also type in the chats, text, what are like some reasons or like what made you guys put in those words? 
Well, I put in tomato mm -hmm. because since I guess as long as I can remember, uh -huh. I've always had tomato soup. And it's kind of the one soup that I've just had throughout my life was that tomato soup when I was like even little. I went to a restaurant and if you ever had like soups, you would have a tomato soup. If we had to oh. cook a soup in our home, I would usually make a tomato soup. And even after coming here to the United States, the first thing I tried out was the tomato soup. Wow. So you can say I like tomatoes, but it's kind of, um, I like uh, tomato soup gives me a lot of freedom. You know, I can just have the soup. Uh, I can like have something with the soup. I can dip something in the soup. I can put croutons in the soup. And it's like, if it's made, if it's <clears throat> cooked in a proper way, there are not too, not too many lumps, it can be really delicious. I really enjoy that. Same, same. I really agree to that. And uh, like, personally, I love tomato too. And, and I think like tomato and uh, sometimes put it in together with potatoes in soup. So that brings up the taste and the texture. How do the tomatoes relate from this country to where you grew up, do they taste about the same? We have like, uh, here in the US, we have Indian tomatoes as well. We have like uh, a different tomatoes as well as the ones that I had back home. So I've tried both. Mm -hmm. The ones that are native to the US do taste a little bit different, but it's not a huge difference. It's like a slight okay. flavor difference, but they are bigger. Oh. Like the ones here in the US are quite bigger. Oh, we have bigger tomatoes? Yes. Wow. Interesting to hear that. Growth hormones probably helps. I was going to say, <laughs> they're bigger because of like the GMOs and all that? Or are they naturally bigger? Naturally oh. bigger. Right. Not the size, it was the shape. And so the tomatoes native to the US are more round, like tomatoes from a movie, kind of like something you see in a a picture, a picture perfect tomato, so to speak, and tomatoes back home in India, they're like oval or ovoid. So, and they're a bit small. I could say GMOs play a role in that, but I don't think it's the, like, people are more concerned now. So it's not that it's just the GMOs. Gotcha. Uh, hello, Ten, uh, welcome. And um, Missy, uh, can somebody send out the link again? Uh, we're actually doing this icebreaker game right now. So, um, feel free to join us and then type in three words you had in mind about soup. We heard it for the first time. Okay, here we go. Tasty, watery. Like, um, I don't know, if you guys feel okay to share, what are some like iconic soup? Um, or like the soup that you think about first, we, he we heard about it, what kind of soup? Like maybe from your own country, um, or I don't know from all experience. Ramen, I love ramen. Oxtail soup, yes. Wow. Yeah, ramen keeps out in my mind a lot. Okay, cool. And um, not sure if you guys have heard about that. Like something in my culture, um, we have something like soup and the combination of um, like I would say uh, shabu. Uh, it's called like hot pot in Chinese culture, which is really, really tasty. And I love that. We normally bring it to a um, fresh taste or a um, spicy taste. Do that. Okay. Should be good with this now. Let me see if there's new, any new words pop up. Pasule, yes. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah. Uh, so let's move on to the presentation part right now. Okay, um, cool. So welcome to our uh, Super Bowl event. And then as mentioned earlier by Eileen, um, this event or, or like this presentation is hosted and then uh, organized and then created by the Global Titan Ambassador team from um, November 20th, 12, 2 p.m. We all know that. Okay, let's move on for this part. And then a quick table of contents. We just did this um, icebreaker and then follow up, we'll, we'll hear a quick stone soup story from one of our presenters and then the history of soup. And then we're gonna do a quick, um, we're gonna do four different type of soups as it, the main presentation today. Starts off with the Cambodian fish noodles and then the matsu bowl soup and then haria soup and the soup of pozole. 
Okay, and then afterward, we're gonna we're gonna have a quick like Kahoot quiz and then uh, like quick game, and then we're gonna we're gonna I'm gonna present the reference of what we get all those information from and the closing and the QRA sections. So all right, let's move on to the presentation. Okay, start off with the stone soup story by Natalie. All right, hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm super excited to tell you more about the history of soup and I'm excited to, for you to all hear more about each of our soups that we have picked for you today. So first off, I'd like to share the story of the stone soup. So it starts off with a wary traveler. So in the picture here, we have the, the man with the little cap and the blue feather. So that's the weary traveler. He's uh, traveling by himself. He's hungry and he stops by this village on the way and he goes door to door asking, hi, can you share some food with me? I'm pretty hungry and I have nothing else to eat. But sadly, a lot of the villagers don't know him and they say, no, sorry, we don't have any food for you. And so the weary traveler says, okay, I'll, I'll just find something else then. And he happens to have a pot and then he goes off to make his own soup. He says, you know, I'm going to make my own soup because, you know, I can't wait for someone to um, feed me. So he, he takes his soup or his stone bowl. He finds a stone, finds some water, and he starts boiling it. And he's boiling, as he's boiling the soup, more, this villager passes by him and asks, what are you doing with just a bowl of hot water and a stone? And the traveler says, well, I'm trying to make soup. And the, the villager says, well, how do, you, how do you make soup with just water and a stone? And then the traveler says, well, if you, you want to contribute, you can bring any type of ingredient, just one, bring it, and I'll add it to the soup. And the villager says, OK, let me go do that. So he goes off to, the, the villager goes off back home, grabs maybe a piece of cabbage, brings back the cabbage, and says, here, put this in. And so the two of them are standing there watching their soup cook. And then another villager comes by and says, what are you both doing? And they explain, well, we're trying to make soup, but if you bring your own ingredient, you can add it in. And so the villager goes back, gets a piece of garlic, brings it back. And so more and more villagers come by and see this group growing and growing. And each person brings something different. One person brings chicken, one person brings onions, one person brings tomatoes. And so then all together, they created the soup all of these strangers came together and made this beautiful, warming and comforting soup. And so the moral of the story is that each person is unique, different, but if you, everyone just contributes one little thing into this one big pot of soup, you can make something beautiful and something warming for everyone. And so that's kind of why we're here today as Global Times Ambassadors. We are here to share with you our experiences, our backgrounds, and this presentation or this project is our own stone soup. And so I'd like to delve a little deeper into the history of soup before giving a taste of what we prepared for you today. Next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, so surprisingly, or I didn't know this before, but soup existed as far back as 20,000 BC. So that's extremely far ago, for a long time ago. And the first archaeological evidence was this clay pot in China. And so these scorch marks show that people back then probably used some kind of method to cook soup. And so with advancements in technology, growth in popularity, and the colonization migration, every region started to develop their own types of soup. So just to give you a few examples, we have American clam chowder, French minestrone, or Italian minestrone, I think, uh, French escargot. And so if we look at modern day soup today and the magnitude of it, and the magnitude of soup, each of us have contributed to the word bank earlier. It's comforting, it's warm. It reminds us of home, just as Tasia mentioned with tomatoes. And so if we look at what food means to us today, especially soup, it carries so much history, so much, uh, so many stories and traditions. And just looking at the pictures we have here, on the top right, we have uh, an old fashioned traditional way of cooking soup. They put the uh, pot and hang it with a large stick, hang it over a fire. But today there's so many different technological advances and it's extremely um, crazy because if you look at the bottom left here, uh, we have a huge bowl of pho. So I, I did some research and 
in Vietnam, they um, had created this huge bowl to serve 3,000 Vietnamese people in order to break a Guinness World Record. So it's about 55 chefs cooking this huge bowl of pho, and it amounted to nearly 3,000 pounds of ingredients, soup, noodles, just to break a Guinness World Record. Like, how crazy is that? From cooking with a small pot over fire to breaking world records. And then also another innovation is bread bowl clam chowder. So this is highly popular in New England and there's uh, lots of clam chowder places in um, San Francisco. And so with more technology, technology, more ways of different, uh, more ways of cooking different foods, we even have Campbell's spaghetti soup or like chicken noodle soup. And so I don't know about all of you, but when I grew up, um, when I wanted something, when I wanted a snack or if I felt sick, I always ask my mom to buy me Campbell's SpaghettiOs because the SpaghettiO line had uh, Star Wars shaped noodles. So I mean, I'm eating uh, SpaghettiOs in the shape of Yoda. So for me, that is a huge uh, memory for me because it reminded me of my childhood and not gonna lie, I have bought in cans before and eat them still today. And so as we go on with the presentation, we'll hear more about comfort foods, cultural anecdotes and traditions passed down. And, with, uh, and I am happy to uh, talk about my first dish, which is Cambodian fish noodles. Okay, so these are Cambodian fish noodles and in Khmer or Cambodian, it's uh, called Nom Pachap. And so I am actually part Cambodian um, along with Chinese and Vietnamese. And so when I was thinking about which uh, region to represent, I wanted to represent Cambodia because there aren't a lot of, there's not a lot of representation for Cambodian people. I mean, I can name a few cities where there is lots of Cambodians that live there, like Long Beach and I believe Syria is. But um, I've, I truly miss Cambodian food. I grew up eating it with my family. And so just to give you a little bit more of what Nopachak is first, it's a light and flavorful dish, typically eaten for breakfast. Um, I actually made my own bowl. I was supposed to save it. I actually ate it all right before this presentation because I was like, yes, this is so good. And so the one thing about this type of soup is that it's actually not hot. So it's not as hot as curry or um, stews or like pho. So it's, it's a perfect dish for the summer. And if you go to Cambodia, it's, a, an, ex, it's an extremely uh, popular street food dish. So you will be, uh, be walking on the streets of Cambodia and people are just sitting there eating nong pachak in the morning. This is how they start their day because it's flavorful, it's full of uh, nutrition, protein. And so going into more of what, why I chose um, or what influenced me to choose this dish. Uh, Marvin, can you move on to the next slide? Okay, so before going to this picture right here, um, one thing about Cambodian food is that there's a lot of French, Thai, and Vietnamese influences because of previous colonizations. So the French actually colonized Cambodia, so that's why you'll see um, baguettes and snail dishes in Cambodia. And then afterwards, you know, Thailand and Vietnamese also had some uh, colonization with Cambodia. But also the Khmer Rouge regime was a huge event in Cambodia where um, many Cambodian families were affected. They had to actually burn their cookbooks and recipes because in this regime, um, the Khmer Rouge kind of wanted to create a utopian culture. So luckily for, unfortunately for my family, they were able to escape. So if you look at this picture on the left right here, uh, there's me with my little bowl cut, but everyone else here is, is uh, my family. So these are my cousins and my brother. And then the person in the red in the middle is my grandpa. And the reason why I put Chef Diane Lamb here is because this is my cousin who is an actual chef right now. And she just recently opened up a uh, Cambodian noodle shop in Portland. And so she kind of inspired me to choose this dish as well because I was actually going to do a different dish. But she mentioned this one and I was thinking, oh wait, this is actually a dish that we ate when we were little. Every weekend we would my cousins and I would uh, visit our grandma and grandparents and every time we ate dinner it was just we would have our own kids table. 
So at our kids' table, there's like five, six, seven of us eating together with our own bowl of noodles. And no Pajak was actually one of them. And so she kind of reminded me of that. And so I said, you know, I'm going to do this dish. And so with the help of my cousin, Diane, um, I'd like to share with you how I made the dish. All right, so how to make nonpa chop. So in the picture, those are gonna be your main ingredients. You've got pickled rhizome. I didn't know what that was, but I bought it and it's actually pretty good. Then there's galangal, which is which looks like a ginger, it has the same spice. I didn't know that until I ate it today. And then um, turmeric, chili powder, lemongrass. Uh, then one of the main fishes that a lot of people use is catfish. And so the way to start off this dish is first you'll boil the fish and uh, boil the noodles in a separate pot. So the main protein of this dish is fish. And what really makes the dish is the different flavors of the turmeric, galanga, uh, pickled rice on the garlic. It's, it brings out the flavor of the fish. And that was, that's going to be our paste. So I blended it. And then I took the fish out after it was done cooking. Um, and it's OK if it breaks apart while you take out the fish. So I rubbed it with paste. And then I put all the mixture, so the paste and the fish, in another pot. Um, I personally like coconut milk and having coconut e dishes. So I added some coconut milk, simmered the mixture, and then afterwards I put some broth just to get it a little bit lighter, seasoned it with fish sauce, coconut, and salt and pepper. Um, and the next step was to cook it until it simmers, but you don't want to overcook it because the heat can cause the coconut milk to clump up, and we don't want that. So afterwards, um, you plate the noodles and you garnish it with basil, bean sprouts, lime. My cousin Diane actually recommended cucumbers, but I, I didn't get to buy it in time. So after you garnish everything, you get nopa chop. I don't know if you can see it, but it's right there. And it's so simple to make. Everything costs less, about $30, and you can make a huge pot. And so I highly recommend this. And thank you so much for listening to my culture a bit more and learning more about what Cambodian food, Cambodian food is like. And so now I'm going to pass it on to Chef Lauren. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Lauren, and I'm going to present on matzo ball soup. Uh, despite uh, maybe stereotypical stereotypes about what Jewish people may look like, I am Jewish. <laughs> I'm I grew up half Jewish, and then my dad was Christian. So I got kind of a cool combination of two different uh, religious backgrounds. Um, and for me, a really big part of my childhood was Jewish food. And so this is what matzo ball soup is. Matzo ball soup, well, well first of all, matzo is unleavened flatbread. Uh, matzo balls are just gonna be, um, the matzo balls are just gonna be combined with eggs and oil. It's matzo meal combined with eggs and oil and you can uh, get that ball form, like you have to shape um, but so basically matzo balls, uh, they were invented back in the biblical days. Um, we can go back to times with Moses and like the enslaved Jewish people. And, um, when they finally got let go by Egypt's Pharaoh, um, they were forced out of their homes so quickly that they didn't have time to properly prepare bread. And so it left them with this unleavened mixture. And when they baked it, it became a flat and hard, like a cracker. So you can kind of look above. Uh, the top left, and you'll see that's what matzo looks like. And actually, I love eating it just as a snack. <laughs> uh, if you go to the store, there's like a small section for Jewish food. Well, it's really small, but it's there. Um, and there's an egg and onion one, and I would totally recommend it. But um, if we can go to the next side, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, when, we, when you eat it. So basically, matzah is you can eat it whenever, but it's a staple dish for Passover, which is a Jewish holiday. Um, and Passover is made for us to remember the day that the Israelites are finally liberated from Egyptian rule. Um, and despite you know being a holiday, it's actually a very somber time. <laughs> and you can see on the bottom uh, right of the screen, that's my family doing Passover. And we look very happy, but <laughs> in a few hours, we're gonna look really depressed because um, <laughs> we'll be reading for a couple hours. But um, it's, it's a time when, you know, we have to remember what our people went through in the past. And so what we do is we'll make a uh, matzo ball soup just as they, they just as they did. We'll, um, we'll have like the soup and then no noodles because, um, 
noodles are bread. And since we couldn't eat bread when we left uh, Egypt, that's like a tradition. Like you can't have anything with bread in it. Um, but you can, you know, put noodles in it on other holidays or if you just want to eat it in general. Um, it generally has uh, carrots, celery, onions, chicken, and then the matzo balls. So if we go to the next slide, I'm going to have um, our chef Zimmern uh, do a little presentation on matzo ball soup for you guys. So enjoy. <laughs> Matzo ball soup, one of my top five favorite foods. It was, I mean, I think even before I had a bottle in my mouth, I was sipping on matzo ball soup. And there's no better time of year to be having it than now as the Passover season is upon us. Although I make this soup at least once a month and there's nothing better than that essential Jewish penicillin, a great chicken soup and no better dumpling to have with it than a classic matzo ball. First thing we wanna do is make our matzo balls so I want to whip my egg whites. I'm going to add a pinch of cream of tartar that's going to help stabilize our egg whites. One of the things about matzo balls is there are two different types. There are heavy, dense sinkers, and then there are floaters. I happen to be a floater guy. And to make good floaters, you got to get air into those balls. And the best way to do that is separate some of my eggs and make some beaten egg whites to fold into our mixture. It's starting to hold some soft peaks. It just refers to the stiffness of the beaten egg whites. We have a nice, stiff egg white. And you see that right there? That'd be a stiff peak. So we're just gonna set those aside. Into our bowl here, we have our garlic and onion powders, baking soda, baking powder, some salt, my egg yolks, some whole egg. 